So welcome to this uh, first of five lectures that the um, Center for um, Structural and Epidemiological Modeling in uh, and the Gender Violence and Health Center uh, are hosting here at LSHTM for the 16 Days of Activism campaign. Let me now hand over to Charlotte Watts, uh, the uh, Senior Scientific Advisor to DFID and founder of the Gender Violence and Health Centre here, who will introduce our speaker for tonight. Good evening. It's really good to be here, um, both both in wearing my DFID Chief Scientific Advisor hat, but also um, as an academic here at the London School. It's really great also to see lots of people wearing orange today to kick off the 16 days. I'm here not wearing orange, feeling a bit embarrassed. So yeah, it's really love. I love the hat in particular. <laughs> I think that should be the mascot for next year, actually. We should all wear orange hats. Um, so I mean, if you work on HIV, if you work on violence against women, you know Laurie Heisey. Um, she's somebody who ha has made huge contributions to both fields, and so it's um, really great to have her here today to talk about how does violence against women affect HIV risk, new evidence on pathways, and to launch a report, a Green Tree report, which came out of a very high level meeting that brought together key stakeholders to relook look at this issue. We're very lucky at the London School to have her as um, director of the Gender Violence and Health Centre and also be uh, a research director of the STRIVE Research Consortium that focuses on addressing the structural drivers of HIV, so that, that includes issues around gender inequality and violence. She also um, leads a number of other important research programmes here at the school, including work on social norms, um, which is a critical element of how do we think about addressing both issues. Um, as well as being leading a number of very important areas of research, She's one of those colleagues that challenges your thinking, really um, makes us think harder about how to design our questionnaires, how to make sure our methods are really tuned to answering the important questions, um, and making sure that our evidence actually feeds into actual, uh, real policy change, because you can't work on these issues without really caring about that that evidence gets used in the end. So to give you a bit of background on Laurie, you probably know that she founded and led the global campaign for microbicides and also that she co-led the WHO multi-country study on women's health and domestic violence. What you may not know is her work has been awarded at very senior levels. So she won, for example, um, the inaugural Amulo Fallobi Award for Excellence in HIV Prevention. I'm sure I said that incorrectly, but it's quite eminent. Um, <laughs> I've had the pleasure of working for Laurie for the past 15, 20 years, so if you Google her, you can find all these facts out about her. <laughs> but from working with her for 20 years, I can tell you she's, the I think, one of the smartest people I know. She's incredibly insightful. She's one of these people who brings quantitative and qualitative insights. And really the thing I think that fundamentally drives everything that she does is really a, a fundamental belief on the need to use evidence to challenge inequality and to further uh, women's rights in the world and so um, she'll give you a bit of an insight on that um, now in her speech in her talk I'm sure so uh, no pressure Laurie and over to you <laughs> so as Charlotte said I originally started out as an activist and an advocate and worked for many many years um, in on the issues of violence against women um, and I got to a point where I didn't have anything new to say. I felt like I had been working and we were doing the same things over and over again and we weren't really advancing. Um, and I felt like I needed to go back and retool. So in my, at 50, I went back and got a PhD. Um, and so this work comes really out of my desire to challenge myself about some of the assumptions that I bring to uh, the work around violence and HIV um, and to really try to dig deeper so that we can actually design our programs better. So Charlotte mentioned STRIVE and, and Charlotte actually was co-research director from, with me um, until she left to go to DFID and STRIVE is a six-year, multi-million dollar pound DFID funded project that looks at 
upstream factors, structural factors, that condition the environment in which people have to make decisions um, around HIV protection and sexuality. So we look at a number of issues, including alcohol availability and drinking norms, stigma and criminalization, gender inequality and um, violence, um, transactional sex. So things that are really upstream with the idea that if we can, inf if we can effectively intervene at that level, we have a chance of not only affecting HIV risk, but a whole host of other positive development outcomes, unwanted pregnancy, sexual and reproductive health outcomes, and the like. Um, and as part of that, we've been doing work on really trying to get a better handle on how uh, violence against women and girls um, works or, or what is the real relationship and is there a relationship that is sturdy enough that we can act on it in a creative way um, more than just sort of advocacy about the the two epidemics that co-occur. So I just wanted to, to locate this discussion a little bit in some ongoing discourse uh, around violence in HIV. Back in 2011, the UNAIDS um, set a set of, of, of priority interventions that all countries should incorporate in their HIV plans. And there were basically three things. There were these basic program blocks, uh, pr program activities, and these were the essentials. So these are condom promotion, uh, voluntary male circumcision, uh, uh, new HIV infections among children, and the like. Then there was a set of activities over here on your left, which was called critical enablers, which are sort of the things which need to go along with uh, these more technological interventions to make sure that they work. And then at the bottom here, they had something called synergies with development sector. And these are things that are important or that were put forward as important, but really should be funded out of other monies. So, and you'll notice that gender-based violence programming was down here in the kind of important, but we're not gonna spend our money on it. Now, at the same time that that discussion was going on in the HIV world, there was sort of a counter discourse where you had uh, women's groups and, and many grassroots HIV groups and everything really making a case very strongly in advocacy spaces that violence against women was absolutely key to women's vulnerability and that we weren't going to be able to solve the issues around uh, uh, prevention of HIV in young girls and women unless we really took on this issue. We also saw, and this was especially true here in the UK, um, a massive increase in discussion around sexual violence and sort of a, a coordinating off of sexual violence from other types, sort of an elevating up of sexual violence, especially sexual violence in conflict situations and rape by combatants and the like as, as really critical to not only women's health and well-being, but to the HIV epidemic. Um, and in fact, there was a global summit when the UK uh, had the presidency of the EU. Some of you, if, if you were around, it was Angelina Jolie and all these people, very high level summit, spent millions of pounds on trying to address this issue of sexual violence and conflict. So that actually, though, raised for me a number of questions is, so what do we really know about the degree to which violence against women um, affects HIV risk and programming? So in what ways does violence increase women's individual risk um, of acquiring HIV? Is violence a driver at a population level? So it, you know, it's very possible that it could increase if a woman is raped or something, she could acquire HIV, but to what extent does this actually drive levels of HIV in different settings? And what if impact, if any, does violence against women have on HIV-related programming? So the success of efforts like trying to encourage people to get testing, um, uptake and adherence to the new generation of HIV prevention technologies that are out there like PrEP and 
and the new vaginal ring and the like, and then also at use and adherence of antiretroviral therapy. And that became even more important, not only for those women who are already infected as a therapeutic, but as we've moved to a to the era where people are taking treatment prophylactically in order to um, reduce their, their uh, infect infectiousness, I guess, to their intimate partners. So in order to try to take this on, we convened, as Charlotte said, this high-level meeting um, of a, a really wide range of people from basic biologists and mucosal immunology to epidemiologists to social scientists to political scientists to really try to review the evidence. And it was held at a foundation called Green Tree Foundation, which is in Upper State, New York. It's a beautiful, uh, beautiful site. Um, and the reason it was called Green Tree 2 is that there had been a Green Tree 1 the year before, and it had been sponsored by uh, the Social Science Research Council and the National Institutes of Health, and they specifically focused on looking at what is the role of genital trauma and injury to the acquisition of HIV amongst women. And we felt uh, that that was too narrow a question. I mean, it, it's important, but we felt that there was a lot more data from other kinds of disciplines that really need to be brought to bear on this que question of what the relationship may be. So the, re the objectives of this, I think it was a three-day meeting, um, was to kind of review the epidemiology of violence against women and, and HIV, to critically assess the evidence of, of whether or not there is a link between violence and HIV acquisition, to evaluate the relative importance of various different pathways. So could we really start to drill down and understand not just is there an association, but how does this actually work? Through what mechanisms does it work? And then to evaluate um, the, the strength of the evidence about the role of violence or fear of violence on HIV-related programming. Um, so with that charge, I just want to take you through some of the, the work that we did at this meeting and then afterwards. So the first thing we wanted to do was to know about the epidemiology of the overlapping epidemics of HIV and, and violence against women. So what do we know? So one thing that we know with great certainty, partly because of the WHO multi-country study on domestic violence and women's health, which Charlotte was also involved in with me, is that intimate partner violence, so violence within relationships, is the most common form of violence against women globally. And what you're looking at there is um, a proportional Venn diagram of the responses of the 24,000 women that we interviewed in 15 different sites in 10 countries. And the orange, the dark orange, is women, proportion who had experienced <coughs> physical violence from a partner. The lighter orange is sexual violence, and the overlap is both. And then the two smaller circles at the bottom, the one on the left, the kind of greenish blue, is the proportion of the women we surveyed um, who had experienced sexual abuse uh, younger than age 15. And the one on the right side is sexual assault or violence over the age of 15. And, and really the message to take away from this is that the orange blobs are much bigger than the other blobs. And there is probably underreporting, no doubt, in terms of the sexual violence elements of things, but it, it would have to be dramatically uh, underreported to, to bring them sort of in, in concert. Um, we also know from the work that came out of the Gender Violence and Health Center that if you do a systematic review of all the prevalence data that are available, um, and this was done, Charlotte led this work, um, was done as part of the Global Burden of Disease exercise that some of you may have heard about, and, and really looking at what are the levels of violence in different regions of the world, and then using modeling to also project down to country level uh, where data may not be available at a country level. 
And what you see here is that globally, and you've probably seen this statistic a lot, uh, one in three women or 30% will experience physical or sexual violence by an intimate partner at some time in their life. Um, you do see some differences. So the high-income countries, which would be U.S., Canada, Australia, the one, um, are about 23% of women versus some of the, like Southeast Asia, is almost 38%. Now, even though there's differences there, this map covers up enormous variation. All right. So what we really know is that. Not everywhere is one in three women experiencing this, and that if you actually go down to the country level or the regional level or the district level, here's a map of Africa, and these are, are you can't really see it here, but basically the dark red is means that 70% to 100% of women in this district or province are beaten in the last 12 months all the way to the very light, which is up to 10%. So even if you're just mapping districts, you start to see real modeling and a lot of differences. If you go in further um, you and go like to the level of the cluster or the neighborhood, you see even more variation. So you can have a village in one setting that is twice as high or three times as high in terms of the level of violence as something 10 kilometers down the road. So that, that itself is a very interesting observation because if we can get a handle on how those, you know, what accounts for those differences, we can start to actually think through s strategies. So just a little bit more in terms of uh, sexual abuse prior to 18. So now in the recent years, the Center for Disease Control and a NGO called Together for Girls has started a series of violence against children surveys that are being done in low-income settings. And they now have about, I think it's 14 of them or something like that. And in general so far, they show that one in four girls and one in seven boys have experienced sexual abuse prior to age 18. Again though, when presented in this way, this gives a slightly distorted uh, picture of what's really going on. Because if you look at those girls who are saying yes, that they have had sexual violence, uh, a large percentage of them have been abused by a boyfriend or a husband. So these are settings where girls tend to partner early. And so it's not the kind of sexual abuse at, of a five-year-old that they're picking up. I mean, there is obviously some of that. But, you know, in Zimbabwe, more than 80% of the sexual abuse of young girls below, below 18 was by husbands or, or boyfriends. Um, the other reason that we focus so much on partner violence, um, in contrast to the discourse, which for example has sort of been focusing much more on sexual violence, especially sexual violence and conflict, is that actually even in settings of conflict, or humanitarian crisis, violence in relationships far exceeds violence by enemy combatants or militia. Now that's not to say that being raped by an enemy combatant is not a horrible, horrible thing. But we have actually been quite critical of the tendency to sort of focus in on one type of violence rec and, and forgetting that there's a whole range of violence and, 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 and exploitation that women and girls and men and boys are experiencing in these settings. So for example, this is data from my colleague um, Mzeda Hossein in Cote d'Ivoire. So here among the 33% of women who reported sexual violence in the 12 conflict affected regions that she was looking at, 29% reported their husband or intimate partner as the perpetrator, and only 0.3% identified an armed combatant. Um, likewise, in DRC, so 35% of women reported sexual violence by intimate partners, and 16 reported sexual violence by someone other than a partner. So again, it's likely that the, there's under-reporting here, but what, you're, what we're doing is we, what the data says to me is that we really need to be thinking about violence writ large in conflict settings and not privileging one particular perpetrator or type of violence. So 
looking at the data, what you see is that IPV and HIV share a, a number of common features, right? So both are endemic at, at really high levels in many parts of the world, especially in East and Southern Africa. They're spatially distributed um, with hot spots um, or pockets of high and low exposure and that are scattered in fairly close proximity. And they both proportionally affect young women, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa. Likewise, I mean, and this is why STRIVE has been so interested, they both share common upstream factors, right, of risk factors such as insecure livelihoods, alcohol availability, and gender norms that drive downstream risk. So just speaking uh, just momentarily to the issue of adolescent girls, and um, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, HIV is the leading cause of death among adolescent girls in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and it is, they are also disproportionately affected. So if you look at adolescent girls and young women, seven out of 10 new infections that are happening in the world are happening in 15 to 19 year olds among girls in Sub-Saharan Africa. So this is both kind of, a, you know, a crisis of health for adolescent girls, but it's also the engine that is continuing to, to fuel a lot of the HIV, um, the sustained HIV uh, transmission in, in this part of the world. So after we looked at all the epidemiology, then we wanted to say, okay, well, what do we know about the degree to which IPV, in this case, the partner violence, increases risk of acquisition? And if it does, by what mechanism? So actually, the, the evidence base on this is really confusing. And it's one of the reasons why in the, in the literature and everything, it's all over the map, because there's many, many cross-sectional surveys um, but some say that it increases risk, some say it doesn't increase risk, and literally it's all over the map. Now one of the problems is the way they've been, many people have coded their violence data. And so a lot of the data is like not appropriately uh, um, coded for the tasks that it's being put to. Um, but if you look at the most recent meta-analysis that's been done by uh, two colleagues that came to the meeting, Duraval and Linskog from um, Sweden, they, Norway, not Sweden, Norway, um, they did find an association. They looked at these DHS surveys, um, and what they were able to do is they have biological endpoint data on HIV and IPV. And they were able to confirm a, an association in multivariate analysis across these 12 DHS surveys in Sub-Saharan Africa, but only in settings where the background rate of HIV is greater than 5%. Um, and one of the things that we know is unlike pregnancy or some of the other issues that we work on, the biggest thing that drives someone's risk is the HIV status of their partner. So if you live in an area where you're likely to partner with someone who's infected, that's gonna almost overwhelm uh, a lot of the other risk factors that you may have in your life. So fortunately though, we do have some better data that we can draw on than the cross-sectional stuff. And now there's at least three, and there's actually five if you include STI endpoints, um, prospective cohort studies where we actually can show an association between experience of violence and incident HIV. So meaning that violence happened, then they became HIV positive within the period of follow-up. And what you see, the, probably the strongest um, example of this is from a study done by Rachel Jukes in The Lancet, published in The Lancet in South Africa. And it was part of a trial of an intervention. And they were able to follow up over time. And the data that are here show that in, in this setting, um, and controlled by a, a variety of other um, baseline correlates, there was a 65% higher risk of um, rate, yeah, sorry, 65% higher risk of, it, of being HIV infected at, of those women who had had more than one episode of violence uh, compared to none or one. 
and that they also used a relationship power scale, so the degree to which women were able to control the, the environment or uh, when and where and how to have sex, um, which also showed this, a large effect here, a relatively large effect, 50%. Now, another guy, N Lee, has done a meta-analysis of all these cohort studies, and, and so these are stronger data than we were looking at before. In the cohort studies, it shows a, a relative risk of 1.28. So that's not a huge, uh, it's not a huge, huge increase in, in risk, but you have to remember that this is a really common behavior. So in these settings, it's like there can be 40 or 50 percent of women are experiencing violence currently and so if you have even a modest increase in risk, it's going to have a big impact on, on at a population level. So existing studies here estimate the distributable fraction of HIV due to IPV is between 12 and 22 percent. So, so we, we convinced ourselves um, that we thought that, yes, there is an association um, and that, you know, but the next question was, well, how? I mean, what are the pathways? What are the mechanisms? And why do we see this association? So this is the model that we ended with. It's a little busy, so let me talk you through it. So if we start here with intimate partner violence, so either the women experiencing violence or the man using violence in the relationship, um, the first possible set of of pathways that have been explored is, are sort of biological. So this is the, back to the idea that sexual violence causes uh, uh, trauma, genital trauma or injury or it, it creates portals of entry for the HIV virus. There's also data there's also data that shows that, that under the, those circumstances you see inflammation which recruits HIV positive lymphocytes, or yeah, HIV positive lymphocytes, not HIV, but just lymphocytes that can become HIV positive, and also immune activation. And so the dominant, if you go into the literature and you, you, you look at, at, or you go into advocacy pieces, most people's storyline is the, the, the way that violence would affect HIV is through genital trauma, sexual violence causing genital trauma, causing H, uh, increased risk of HIV. Interestingly enough, though, there's very little epidemiological evidence of that. Um, it's true that an individual who is raped or, or is subject to sexual violence can have become infected, but if you look at all of the cross-sectional and the cohort data, most of it doesn't show an association between sexual violence and HIV. If anything, it shows an association between physical um, violence and HIV. Um, and, and trying to think through why might that be is what I was saying earlier before is that the biggest driver of HIV risk in partnerships is the HIV status of your partner, right? So you can be raped and have huge, uh, a very large other uh, risk profile, but if, if your partner's not infected, it's not going to affect, uh, not going to affect your likelihood of becoming infected. And if you think about if you're, most of the women in these surveys are in ongoing partnerships. So for them, their exposure is probably more defined by the frequency of, of sex with an HIV positive partner than a smaller incremental increase in risk because occasionally that sex is forced or coerced. Um, so uh, that may not be the reason, but in thinking through, that's sort of what, uh, what we were uh, thinking could be why we don't see it in terms of sexual violence. What's interesting, though, is that while genital trauma doesn't seem to be nearly as important as people have sort of made it out to be, mental trauma <laughs> is actually uh, proving to be quite important. And so 
after the Green Tree 2 uh, meeting, the NIH had us another meeting about looking at, and they have a, a request for proposals that they're funding now, looking at the role of trauma, um, PTSD, trauma, and, and depression, and all of those things on immune activation in the genital tract, on um, T cell function, on dysregulation of cortisol. So s these biological mechanisms that actually show that are linked with physical and emotional abuse and up or down regulation of women's genital immune response. So it's still very speculative, but it might be actually that some of the, the more traumatic elements are influencing the immune response in a more important way than even the physical breaches that you might see. So then another, another uh, hypothesis is that, that basically what we're talking about is, is violence affecting the likelihood of HIV through fear and control, or, or uh, basically abusive uh, abuse, reducing women's access to HIV, reducing her ability to adhere to biomedical prevention options, reducing her ability to negotiate con condom use, so all of those types of things. Um, and here, this is a, a, a review article that was done by a team of folks uh, colleagues in South Africa and um, here at the school of looking at <coughs> partner violence and its different impacts on care and treatment cascades uh, as well as prevention cascades. So what you see in this is that fear of violence reduces women's willingness to go for HIV testing, that fear of violence lengthens the time between linkage seeking care, uh, history of physical or sexual IPV decreases ART uptake. Um, current IPV is linked to poor adherence of ART, and gender violence is also associated with poor HIV outcomes. So it seems to have lower CD4 counts and increased virological failure and opportunistic infections. So, so that is some evidence that suggests that that pathway may be operative. Um, and then the, the last two are these indirect pathways. And what I mean by that is that if you look over here on the left, you have women's exposure to sexual abuse in childhood. And one of the things that we know is that both men and women who are abused, in, uh, if abused in childhood, are at higher risk of acquiring HIV in adulthood. And it seems to be mediated through both sort of a cascade of responses, psychological, stress-related responses, as well as increased sexual risk-taking. So women who have been sexually abused are more likely to be re-victimized as adults, to have more concurrent partners, <coughs> to, tra to engage in transactional sex, or to engage in sex work. And that, so you end up with this sort of exposure pathway, which either directly goes to increased risk, or you end up I influencing it um, through some of these other determinants. Likewise, you have over here that man, men's exposure to sexual abuse or even witnessing physical violence greatly increases his likelihood to perpetrate. And so what's interesting is there's this clustering of risk factors. So the men who beat their wives uh, in these studies also are more likely to binge drinkers, they're more likely to have outside sexual partners, they're more likely to seek um, uh, have relationships with sex workers or purchase sex. They're more likely to engage in anal intercourse. So these guys, it could be basically an issue of higher exposure, right? So that, the, that, that in effect, I call this sort of the rot, rotten bum theory, but you know, these guys who are violent also have other corollary behaviors that are actually putting her at risk because he's more likely to be positive. So there's been some effort to try to test these various different hypotheses. And, and there were two, two sets of data that were presented at the, the meeting, which were, I found really interesting. 
One is they were both looking at which pathway appears to be the most significant when examined among subsets of women from African demographic and health surveys. So in those surveys, as I said before, we have biological HIV data and we have data on IPV. So they, one, these two uh, sets of researchers were looking at direct links, either through sexual violence or inability to protect oneself, or these indirect links that we were just talking about in terms of through her having outside partners or more risky sex or him having outside partners and more risky sex. So these are the exposure ones. And so Duveron and Linscombe also published, and they, ex they explore this by examining three samples of women in 12, these 12 African DHS surveys that they, I was talking about before. And they stratified by the HIV uh, status of their partners. And I'll get to that in a second. Also, the folks that actually do the DHSs um, around the world uh, published an article where they were testing competing hypotheses among actually matched pairs. So in this, this 12 DHS survey thing, it's basically, these are not necessarily couples, whereas here, these were actual couples that they were looking at, um, taken from five African DHSs. So this is complicated, and if you're really interested, I suggest you just go and, and read this part of the report. But more or less, what they were, by, by stratifying on the HIV status of the male partner, so you start out with your women on the left here who are married or cohabiting, and you divide, you look at one, first you look at women whose male partners are HIV positive. Then you look at women whose male partners are known to be HIV negative. And then you look at a group that's exposed to the entire group of men so that there's HIV positive and negative. And then you look at the pooled findings across the data sets. And so in this case, when the partner is HIV positive, women who are exposed to IPV are equally likely to be HIV positive as those not exposed. So what that means is on average, over here, IPV doesn't de didn't decrease women's ability to protect themselves from HIV within their relationship. So this would be counter evidence to the idea of a, of a power and control kind of thing. Here, this subset, they found that women exposed to IPV were equally likely to be HIV positive as those not exposed. And the interpretation of that is on average, women did not acquire HIV from their own outside sexual partners. Whereas <laughs> when you had both groups together, what you found is that women were more likely to be HIV positive when exposed to IPV. And what that suggests is that violent men are more likely to be <laughs> HIV positive and therefore to infect their partners. So that sort of speaks more to this idea that you have this clustering of risk behaviors amongst the men. So summary in terms of the <laughs> insights from the epidemiology is that current evidence suggests that there's this clustering of risk beha behaviors and that HIV program should focus on risky behavior among men using violence as a marker for HIV risk and upstream structural factors that affect both HIV and IPV. So I just wanted, another thing we did briefly, and these are all described in much greater detail, is look at what do we know from intervention studies about what works to prevent or, or, or reduce uh, either partner violence or partner violence in HIV. So one of the trials that has been published is, um, is this SHARE trial, which is looking at the effectiveness of, of, of a intervention for partner violence and HIV in Rakhine, Uganda. And they were able to show that using a community mobilization approach and using counseling, um, adapting ca uh, adapted form of counseling, that they were able to reduce both sexual, physical IPV and forced sex as reported by women and increase disclosure of the HIV results. Basically what this trial tested was a community 
based mobilization to change norms around IPV and offer integrated violence and HIV prevention programming. And then they also put in screening and brief intervention to address IPV in the context of HIV testing and counseling. Um, now, there's also been, and we've done a lot of the, uh, Charlotte and, and her team has done a lot of the evaluations of this, um, work around SASA, which is a, a community mobilization approach that was designed specifically to look at the intersections of, of IPV violence and, and HIV. And in, a, in this trial, they were able to demonstrate significant shifts in attitudes supporting of wife beating, reductions in past year occurrence of physical violence among women with a history of violence, numbers of concurrent outside partners among men, and women's ability to refuse sex, amongst other things. But so, um, again, some, some fairly significant, it was like a 52%, I think it was, 52% reduction, which is large for a behavioral change over two, to, uh, two or three years. Um, and, and these are just some additional trials. I'm not going to go into them. They're described a bit in the, in the report. But we're starting to, to, the main message here is that we're starting to actually have a rigorous uh, data uh, evidence base, rather, in terms of showing that we actually can affect these kinds of things. Um, and, and so, you know, the recommendations take, that we're taking away from that is, um, and these are actually my recommendations more than, than, the, um, than the reports per se. I mean, I was just trying to say, after going through trying to put this together, what are the things that I was thinking about? So, I mean, obviously, I think we need to adapt and implement the programs that are proven to reduce violence and improve HIV outcomes on a wider scale than we are. And the DREAMS program, if you're, for those of you who are familiar, the U.S. government through PEPFAR and USAID is implementing a big program to try to reduce risk among adolescent girls in Sub-Saharan Africa. And so they have, for example, tried to include SASA um, in the package of, of interventions that they're going to roll out in the communities to reach adolescent girls. The problem is, is that the implementation is really weak. It's a, not an easy program necessarily. and on the ground capacity is, is very weak still um, because these are new types of programs. I think we should do more to prioritize hotspots where both IPV and HIV levels, are, especially among men, are high. Um, they're starting to target a lot of HIV programming now using um, uh, you know, mapping of looking at, you know, where where are the real pockets of risk for young girls and where are the real pockets of risk for men. Um, and we can do that as well with HIV, but we haven't actually tried to put those on top of each other and see how well we're targeting in terms of, of bang for the buck, so to speak. I think we should also explore opportunities to help women identify high-risk men or high-risk relationships by using binge drinking and violence as a marker for HIV risk. So we're starting to see in over and over again this clustering. And, and, and women have, I think, a real need to, emotionally it's very difficult to try to think of yourself as risk in an ongoing relationship that's important to you. But it's easier to talk about your husband's drinking or even, I mean, everybody in most villages know who are the men that are violent. I mean, and so it might be that we could get a better read on, the, on high, who is and is not HIV infected by asking about some of these other items that are less threatening. Um, and then I think we need to also do a lot more research to just try to understand these pathways better because you know, if my first impulse in looking through this data, which is very preliminary, is wrong, um, you know, it's, we would be targeting differently. So, you know, one answer says, oh, we really should be focusing on men and boys and some work with women. Others might be, oh, we really need to be focusing on child sexual abuse or we really need to be focusing, you know, I mean, so depending on what the mechanism is, we could be, you know, missing the really important intersection. So 
that is the talk. And I just want to acknowledge that the report is, is was sponsored, co-sponsored by UNICEF, World Health Organization, UNAIDS, and UK Aid, and the Green Tree Foundation. So thank you. Okay, um, we've got um, a few minutes. I'm going to hand it over now to questions or comments. Hi, um, I'm just trying to get my head around um, the figure five that you presented from the report. I, I guess I wonder what your thoughts are about whether this is actually more of a power issue than maybe an actual uh, difference because the first two are, my understanding was the first two are subsets of the third. So maybe there's just a significant difference in the third because there are more people in the analysis? I think, I mean, I, I didn't, I think with 26,000 women, pro probably that's not an issue, but, but it's a thought. I mean, this is what I mean. We, there needs to be much more work done on this. Um, so, but because, uh, you know, I don't know what the <coughs> breakdown is between HIV positive and HIV negative. So obviously there's going to be far more negative men than positive. But I don't know how big the HIV positive subset is off the top of my head. I guess then the alternative explanation would be the third is only significant because you have so many people. So it might be a very small effect, but it's not, maybe it's not clinically meaningful. Because is, is it not that subset one plus subset two equals subset three? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So they're the I'm same women. Yeah. No, so, so basically all they're doing is they're stratifying, they're stratifying on the HIV status of the partner to try to get a handle on, for example, if it says if he's HIV positive, okay, so there's no difference. So basically the IPV in that case doesn't seem to be, the IPV in their relationship doesn't seem to be the thing that's mediating the impact on her HIV status. So, but it's very confusing. I mean, you'd have to look at the whole thing written out. I think possibly the, the bit of information that is missing is how big that effect is. And right. I, think, um, I think it's true that with uh, various thousand women, it's unlikely that there are issues of power unless one of those two subsets is only composed of a very few hundred people. I think given prevalence um, data, it's that's also unlikely. That. So I guess, um, you know, potentially one could argue that the fact that it's significant is actually not very interesting. What matters is really the what size. The size is, yeah. So, can I ask one then? Sure. I mean, you were saying about PEPFAR. I mean, what's great about Pep PEPFAR is that they're really trying to tackle this issue. Right. Um, we've got a lot of promising evidence, but we don't say this is definitively what we should do. And then you've got that delivery capacity. So it's just how do we deal with that as a field? You know, what if we're thinking, you know, and particularly with a new political environment, what you know, what is, yeah, what is the next stops following PEPFAR? You know, what 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 you know within the field should we be starting to set up or plan for? Well, I mean, I think the that the Dreams Initiative was overly is overly ambitious, but is important because it's the only initiative that right now that says specifically recognizes the, the role of adolescent girls in and the future of the epidemic and also the impact of HIV on adolescent girls. And it's really trying to, if you look at the, the package that they're putting together, is they are trying to keep girls in school, they're trying to influence norms, they're trying to provide PEP, PrEP, uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis. They're trying to sort of do a structural and biological, um, a, a true combination prevention approach. I think that the first generation is just going to be learning, I mean, quite frankly, and, and, and because I think we actually don't have very many examples of people trying to, to do these complex multifaceted interventions. So I think what we should be doing is a lot more like implementation science. So rather than spending a lot of money right now on doing big trials, which is actually what they are doing, 
um, I would spend more money on trying to figure out what's working and not working at an implementation end and how to, to use research to generate knowledge to improve the intervention and figure out what actually works versus what looks like on paper and then move on to doing some of the more sophisticated evaluations. Um, I was just looking at the potential pathways that you listed mm -hmm. and I was wondering is it to be assumed also then um, you have man's childhood exposure to violence leading to the rotten bum theory. <laughs> is this to be Don't assumed that. that also depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder was measured as well within them or is that a... We don't a, actually have that. Because I mean, that could also be some sort of a be. prevention to the violence that they're committing. So, I mean, we do know, what we know is that boys and girls, but boys in, the, in that part of the pathway, Boys who were exposed to violence at, in their childhood, either witnessing it or experiencing it themselves, are at much higher risk of reproducing that pattern. Um, I don't think we've done a very good job, or I have not seen many studies that try to look at sort of the mental health consequences or trauma effects. I mean, there is some in the high income literature or high income countries where it shows that, that part of what creates that pattern is trauma induced kind of um, developmental uh, issues and, and trauma induced ch changes in brain structure and all sorts of stuff. But in the low and middle income countries, we don't have that kind of data yet. And so we just have this kind of basic epi data that's mostly coming out of HIV. And so they're not asking about mental health and stuff, which they should, I mean, I think that would be a, a, an obvious sort of next, yeah. next step. I just had uh, two questions. You can choose which one you want to answer. If you <laughs> I was very fascinated by the map that you showed, uh, where you said that the pattern that we could see was actually replicated at the smaller, at oh, the uh -huh. more granular level. And I was wondering whether you think that implies that we need different kind of mathematical models to study these epidemics than the ones that we currently have. And then I was also very uh, struck by how you said that it may be necessary to tackle upstream determinants of risky behavior and mm -hmm. kind of HIV um, positiveness, like a sort of um, uh, HIV incidence. Uh, and I was wondering whether, so I, I am very convinced by the argument you make around social norms and, and changing that mm -hmm. dimension. And I was wondering whether you thought there were other uh, elements that you think could be worth exploring in this sense? So, I mean, I think, I think some of the gender norms issues, I think alcohol availability, I think insecure livelihoods for both women and men are going to affect both risk of HIV and risk of IPV. I mean, there's probably lots of other things. Keeping girls in school um, through secondary education. I mean, what we know is that uh, and keeping boys in school for that matter, because in men that are, are boys that complete secondary education are at lower lower risk of IPV. Now, I, I think it goes back and forth with HIV, so it's a, it's a little bit less clear. Um, but you know, I think I think we could try to do a better analysis than perhaps we have of sort of what what are the kind of most um, the best areas to sort of intervene that we would get the, the most positive impact for both HIV outcomes and IPV outcomes. Um, in terms of your first question, I mean, I, I had in here, which was really interesting, there was just an article that came out in, in Lancet Infectious Diseases, and it was a letter, and what they showed is they show, it was a, one of these heat maps where they show the level of HIV um, it, it was in Lesotho. What you have is, is right now we're modeling and, and, H, and UNAIDS is using these kind of maps um, to figure out like hot spots for, for doing uh, PEPFAR and other things, but they're not disaggregating them by gender or by sex. 
And so what these people did is they took the same thing and they showed the map for women and girls and the map for men and boys. And what was really fascinating about it is they're, it's, it's really different. And, and they could even go in to the level of like, you could see on the map that this area has really high rates for men and women and it was a dam project. And you know, this place over here had really high rates for, for women and girls, but not men. And, and so, I mean, I think we could get a much more sophisticated, I think, than we are, but it's not gonna ha help if they're not disaggregating it by sex. Okay, I think we need to wrap up here, but um, I want to thank you again, Laurie, for such a, a great talk. I really summarized a very large set and complex set of data um, so well done and thank you.